So the exotic behavior of water. Why does an ice cube, now we're getting into this, why does an ice cube or iceberg float in water? When you freeze most liquids, they compress. A bottle of water, you put it in the freezer, it's going to expand, right? It looks like the bottle's going to burst. So when you freeze water, it expands. Why does this happen? Why is it you put an ice cube in water? You're thinking, well, ice cube is hard, it should just sink. But it doesn't. It floats. Again, hydrogen bonds. That's what's going on over here. It's dealing with density. And you know, if something's very dense, it sinks. Something that's not dense, it will float when compared to whatever that liquid is. In this case, we're dealing with water. So density is determined by how close the molecules are with each other. That's what density is. If I take a ball that's made of cast iron, and that same size ball is made out of styrofoam, they're the same size, but one is more dense than the other, right? It's because of the molecules in the steel ball, the molecules are closer together. Whereas in styrofoam, they're further apart. All right, so styrofoam apple, I used apple up there, ball, whichever. So it's not determined by size, it's determined by the molecules inside and how close they are with each other. So that brings the point about water and ice. Okay? Water in the liquid form. Water molecules move freely around. Okay? Hydrogen bonds are always breaking and reforming. Breaking, reforming, breaking, reforming. And it does that in milliseconds all the time. It doesn't just stay like that. It can be bonds. It can easily form with another one just like that. So when you decrease the temperature, water behaves like other liquids until 4 degrees Celsius. That's very weird. Does everything that other liquids do until four degrees Celsius. Whether expanding or compressing. But between zero degrees and four degrees, this is weird phenomenon that happens. Okay? The bonds, the hydrogen bonds, form this crystalline layer, lattice. Almost like a uh, similar to uh, like fencing, you know, like the, what a fence looks like, you know, like that kind of thing, like a lattice, okay? And it becomes more stable and pushing the molecules further away from each other. This is a bunch of water molecules, okay? And this is in the liquid form. Water molecule here, there's one here, there's all in here. And they're all, all these white and blue things on here are bonds, okay? Hydrogen bonds. And they're touching everything, okay? So what's going to happen here is that when, this is in a liquid form, and it's in this form, and the bonds are breaking and not, and, and things like that, but then what happens here is that My arms are doing this, but as, and let's say there's another person over here and doing the same thing here, but as we're getting the temperatures going down, especially between zero and four degrees, it becomes stiffer, but it gets stiff like this, not like this. It gets stiff like this. This is the natural position that the water molecules want to go in, and so is that person over there. So now if I touch his hand over there, we're going to be very, my main body, like this is my, Water molecule, I'm going to be very far apart from that person. And that's what happens. But in water, liquid form, it's kind of doing this kind of thing. So it's very close like this. But when it gets frozen, it does this. I'm the first person that came up with this relationship with water. Okay? It does that. Liquid. And then this is going to be ice. Liquid, ice. 
Now, the only thing I don't like about this model is that you have to think that there's molecules all in there, too. It creates a lattice that's happening in between. It's not hollow. But each one of these black things is going to be a water molecule. And the bonds over here are hydrogen bonds. There's liquid. That's solid. Liquid, water, ice. It's made of the same stuff. I didn't add anything to this. I didn't subtract anything to this. I didn't put more water molecules here. I didn't put more hydrogen bonds here. That is the same thing as that. Correct? But what about the density? That's dense. That's not. Do you see the difference? If you put this in water, what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen with this? Float? Yeah, it'll float. And that's why we have ice that floats. That's why we have icebergs that float. Does that make sense? Can you visualize? I, I'll show you some stuff on here, okay? The water and the ice form, ice will expand due to the spaced out lattice arrangement, like you just saw with that one. Ice will be less dense than water. It's made of the same stuff. It just goes into that form. So ice and icebergs will flow on water. Amazing how that works. So there it is, water, all condensed like that, and that's what it looks like with ice. It's less dense. So why is it that water expands in the freezer when you put a bottle of water there? It expands. It goes, the molecules go further apart than they, from each other. That's why it does that. Because of hydrogen bonds. You don't find hydrogen bonds in alcohol. It's the hydrogen bonds that are doing this. And that's why the water, when it goes in the freezer, it expands. This is why the water of an ice cube, you put it in water, it'll float. It's less dense. Does it make sense? Fascinating. I guarantee a few of you students will talk to your parents about this. <laughs> You're going to throw an ice cube in, the, in your drink and say, you know what I'm saying over here? You know, and ask them about that. I, they will be fascinated. I talked to my wife about this thing, and, and my daughter's in, uh, going to eighth grade, and they don't care about it. I mean, they care about science and stuff, but that's something that's really fascinating. You would think that ice sinks. It doesn't. Try it. All right? So the significance of this water's weird density behavior helps with biology, helps us to understand about habitats. Ponds and oceans would not freeze solid. I think about that. If you want to ice fish, you go to a pond that's frozen, but it's not frozen all the way. It's only frozen at the top layer. Remember, things happen at the top layer first. And it goes from there and works its way down. It doesn't get all the way down. Now, the other property it has is that because we have an ice, you know, on, on, on a pond, you have the ice uh, that's, that's forming on it, whether it's like seven or eight feet inches thick, it also acts as insulation so that the energy that's in the water where all the fish doesn't escape. So now the fish, it's colder water, but it's not going to be frozen that would freeze the fish. Okay? But that's what happens over here. You don't see the oceans and the lakes freeze solid. It doesn't happen like that. All right? So this allows marine life to continue to grow and flourish and do whatever they want to do. The upper inches of the ice in the ocean insulate the water below it. Even if there's not, you know, oceans don't freeze, but even when it's, <coughs> um, the upper portion is going to insulate the lower portion. So ice at the poles is going to provide a solid habitat for life forms to happen, right? You've got polar bears and penguins. You know, polar bears like swimming, but there's going to be times they want to sleep. They can't sleep in the water. So it's nice to have, let's say, you know, like a, a 
And you've seen that where we have ice caps that are just floating in the water so that polar bears can go on there and they can mate and make more baby polar bears and things like that and penguins and stuff. So it gives them a place to stand. It gives them a place to do whatever they want to do. All right? That's why we've got to do this thing, right? You don't want it to melt away, right? We're going to talk about global warming you know, a little bit later or whatever. But you don't want it all to melt away because then the polar bears have no place to go, right? They need that habitat. They can't, it's going to be difficult for them to adapt to, you know, warm areas. They're used to that, right? And then they've got to compete with all the other animals for food because now they've got to go to a warmer area and get food that all the other bears are getting, right? They were fine over there. No one was bothering them. They were eating their own fish. They've got to just deal with the penguins. And if they have to, they'll eat a penguin themselves. Okay. Water is the liquid of life. We drink it, we bathe in it, we farm, cook, and clean with it. It's the most abundant molecule in our bodies. In fact, every life form we know of would die without it. But most importantly, without water, we wouldn't have iced tea. Mmm, iced tea. Why do these ice cubes float? If these were cubes of solid argon in a cup of liquid argon, they would sink. And the same goes for most other substances. But solid water, aka ice, is somehow less dense than liquid water. How's that possible? You already know that every water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. Let's look at a few of the molecules in a drop of water. And let's say the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. The molecules are bending, stretching, spinning, and moving through space. Now. Let's lower the temperature, which will reduce the amount of kinetic energy each of these molecules has. So they'll bend, stretch, spin, and move less. And that means that on average, they'll take up less space. Now you'd think that as the liquid water starts to freeze, the molecules would just pack together more and more closely. But that's not what happens. Water has a special kind of interaction between molecules that most other substances don't have, and it's called a hydrogen bond. Now remember that in a covalent bond, two electrons are shared, usually unequally, between atoms. In a hydrogen bond, a hydrogen atom is shared, also unequally, between atoms. One hydrogen bond looks like this. Two look like this. Here's three, and four, and five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I could go on. In a single drop of water, hydrogen bonds form extended networks between hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions of molecules. And these bonds are constantly breaking and reforming. Now back to our water as it cools down. Above 4 degrees Celsius, the kinetic energy of the water molecules keeps their interactions with each other short. Hydrogen bonds form and break like high school relationships. That is to say, quickly. But below 4 degrees, the kinetic energy of the water molecules starts to fall below the energy of the hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds form much more frequently than they break, and beautiful structures start to emerge from the chaos. This is what solid water, ice, looks like on the molecular level. Notice that the ordered hexagonal structure is less dense than the disordered structure of liquid water. And you know that if an object is less dense than the fluid it's in, it will float. So ice floats on water. So what? Well, let's consider a world without floating ice. The coldest part of the ocean would be the pitch black ocean floor, once frozen, always frozen. Forget lobster rolls, since crustaceans would lose their habitats, or sushi, since kelp forests wouldn't grow. What would Canadian kids do in winter without pond hockey or ice fishing? And forget James Cameron's Oscar, because the Titanic totally would have made it. Say goodbye to the white polar ice caps reflecting sunlight that would otherwise bake the planet. In fact, forget the oceans as we know them, which at over 70% of the Earth's surface area regulate the atmosphere of the whole planet. But worst of all, there would be no iced tea. Mmm, iced tea. Okay, change gears now a little bit. A solute. A solute is the dissolved substance in any liquid mixture. 
Let's talk about lemonade. Right? Lemonade is made of crystals and water. Right? You do the crystal light. Right? You do the crystals is the solute. You put the solute in the solvent, which is the water. The water is that liquid that holds the other substance in the mixture. All right? These are just definitions as we use these words. So water is our body's main solvent. 60% of our body is water. So that things get mixed in that water. So when you take this lemonade crystals and put it in the water, you put the solute in the solvent, the whole thing is called a solution. Okay? <clears throat> and if the solvent is water, we refer to it as an aqueous solution. Okay? We put it in an alcohol drink, like ethanol. That is not an aqueous solution. An aqueous solution is only referring to water as the solvent. So, what happens when we mix water with a salt? Okay? When you take sodium chloride, right, just regular table salt, it's made up of all those crystals, which is sodium and chloride, held together by what kind of bonds? Ionic, yeah, ionic. Hydrogen bonds are really dealing with water. So sodium chloride is held together by ionic bonds. It's made of one sodium molecule, and one chloride molecule. And they're held together by these ionic bonds that are more or less like magnets. You can break them apart, but something needs to break them apart. Well, you put it in water, water is going to break it apart. Then what happens to the sodium? What happens to the chloride? Well, the sodium is then surrounded, because sodium has a positive charge, it's going to be surrounded. Now, just think about my water molecule. Water molecule has two hydrogens that are partially positive, and it has an oxygen that's partially negative, right? The negative electron negativity. You have a sodium you have Sodium. Right? Does that make sense? Okay? 
So what do you think is going to be attached to the chloride of the water molecule? Yeah, the hydrogens. So you're going to have hydrogens that are going to be over here. And the oxygens will be away from it. Does that make sense? That's what's happening here. It's making this shell over these ions. All right? We call it a hydration shell. Or a hydrogen sphere, because it's kind of making like a sphere like structure on there. So you put sodium chloride in the water. The sodium is going to be surrounded by the hydrogens, I'm sorry, by the oxygens, the red over there. And the chloride is going to be surrounded by the hydrogen portions of the water molecules. Those water molecules are starting to, here's the big amount of sodium chloride that you just put in the water. It's going to gradually start breaking this all up and surrounding it and turning it that way. That's dissolving sodium chloride in water. That's what's happening. And that's what a salt is. Not a salt. A, you know what I mean. I just thought about that. Not a salt like you're going to hit someone. But, you know, salt. Yeah. Okay? So water mixed with a non-ionic polar solute. Ooh. So when the sugar is placed in water, it is also water soluble. Okay? Parts of the sugar are partially positive and partially negative. So it's not ionic, but there's certain parts of a large molecule like sugar that is going to be um, partially positive and partially negative. So water molecules form hydrogen bonds with the sugar molecule. As much as you see hydrogen bonds happening with different water molecules, they can also form hydrogen bonds with other things that would be partially negative or partially ne uh, positive. So, in other words, you have this big thing, all right? So, sugar, you could call this, this isn't sugar, this is a lysosome, a lysosome molecule. Uh, which is different than sugar, but it works the same way as sugar. So you have this gigantic thing over here. And parts of it is going to be partially negative, and parts of it will be partially positive. It's huge. So water molecules, depending on if it's what part is negative, which one is positive, but it'll do the same thing as that, except not just one ion, it'll do it around the whole thing, allowing that sugar to be dissolved in that water. So sugar is not an ion, it's a big molecule. But there's parts of it that's negative and parts of it that are positive. And that's making a sugar molecule pull. You clear with that? Right? Okay? Some other water terms. Hydrophilic. We'll be using these terms. Hydro meaning water, uh, and philic meaning loving. So this is parts of a structure that like water. Okay? It interacts with water. Ions and polar molecules. Things that have charges love water. And we'll be able to dissolve the water. Hydrophobic, phobic, excuse me, phobic meaning fear, right? You don't like it, hate it. So this is water hating stuff. That's what it does, I guess it says. Does not interact with water. Oils. You take oil and mix it with water. Shake it up. It's not going to dissolve. You let it sit, it'll separate because the oil does not like the water, or vice versa, right? It's hydrophobic. You take sugar or salt and put that in water and shake it up. 
It'll go faster if you heat up the water, but it would dissolve in there because it's polar, it's ionic, it has some kind of charge. That's a big key understanding when we deal with a lot of these molecules when you get into biology. Certain foods are going to have problems getting absorbed into your system. Molecular mass. I'm going to keep this short but sweet with this. Just because I know your book goes into some certain things on here. The molecular mass is the sum of all the masses of the atoms in that molecule. So if you have water, all right, it's just an easy thing. I would expect you to memorize it, but if I gave you molecular masses, you could figure it out pretty easily. The molecular mass of hydrogen is one. The molecular mass of this hydrogen is one. The molecular mass of oxygen is 16. So what's the molecular mass of the whole thing? Eight. It's as simple as that. I wouldn't expect you to know those hydrogens are pretty easy. But that's where that comes up. They talk about molecular mass in your book. Okay? Numbers of molecules are usually measured in moles. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to repeat the number of this, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But I want you to understand what that is because they will, we will be talking about moles. You won't have to calculate, but they will be talking about moles. And one mole equals that many molecules. All right? The best way I can explain this is that you understand it. You know how we say the word dozen? All right? One dozen eggs equals 12 eggs. One mole is going to be that many molecules. So two moles is going to be twice the amount. Two dozen means you're going to have 24 eggs. So think of mole as dozen, but not the number 12. All right? But that's what that is. I know a lot of students that mix up, what's a mole? What is that? A mole is just our way of just saying in way that. You know, like, or, well, I'm thinking weight because in, um, in England, where I was for a year and a half, they used the word stone. Who here has heard of that? How many stones do you weigh? Yeah, a few of you. I didn't know what that was. I was going crazy, you know, because that's just something as doctors over there, they just say, you know, if you ask the patient, oh, I weigh like, you know, like uh, 32 stones. I'm like, I don't think, where am I, Fred Flintstone? What, what are you talking about stones? What I, one stone equals 14 pounds. Why they do that, I don't know. Another one that also drives me nuts is a fortnight. Yeah, who knows what a fortnight is? What is it? Two weeks. I don't know. Farm countries use Fortnite. Oh, I, I've gone on a vacation for a fortnight. I'm like, what? But a fortnight equals two weeks. All right? You know, if someone says, you know, how tall is that thing? Oh, it's one foot. Well, one foot is 12 inches. So I'm sure they say we're weird too. Okay? But that's all it is. One mole is that. And think of a mole like a dozen. Okay? Um, again, I'm not going to ask you to repeat that number. I just, when you do your readings and stuff, if you go to chemistry, that's what that is, and I don't want you to be lost on something like that. Molarity. That's another thing, again, that I'm not going to ask you, but you're going to see a capital M on a lot of different things in there. Molarity is the number of moles. Again, you've got to understand what moles is to understand the definition of it. But it's the number of moles of solute per liter of that solution. Okay? So how many moles of that crystal-like crystals are in one liter of water to give you that lemonade? That's what it's asking. Okay? The concentration, how's that? That's another way of thinking of it. It's dealing with concentration. Life, as we know it, would not exist without water. Over 70% of the planet is covered in water, and our bodies are around 70% water. But why is water so important? The structure of a water molecule, and the fact that it is capable of forming hydrogen bonds with multiple other water molecules simultaneously, provides water molecules with some very unique characteristics. These include the ability to act as a universal solvent, the properties of cohesion and adhesion, a high surface tension, 
a high heat capacity, and changes in density based on temperature. Let's take a look at each of these in turn. Water is often called the universal solvent, which means that many substances dissolve in it. Water solvency has to do with the polarity and hydrogen bonding ability of water molecules. When a salt, such as sodium chloride, is placed in water, the negative ends of the water molecules are attracted to the positively charged sodium ions, and the positive ends of the water molecules are attracted to the negatively charged chloride ions. This attraction causes the sodium and chloride ions to break up or dissociate in water. Why is this important? Since our cells are mostly water, these solutions of ions and molecules allow chemical reactions to occur much more frequently, which is an important feature to allow organisms to respond to their environment. Water molecules are also cohesive and adhesive. The hydrogen bonds in water cause water molecules to stick together, a property known as cohesion. Polar bonds also give molecules an adhesive property, or the ability to cling to other polar surfaces. Why is this important? Well, water fills the internal transport systems of plants and animals. Because of these cohesive and adhesive properties, water allows for the efficient transport of nutrients and waste within an organism. Water also has a high level of surface tension. Because water molecules at the surface are more strongly attracted to each other than to the air above, water molecules cling tightly to each other. The surface tension of water explains why it beads up on waxy surfaces and why water striding insects are able to walk on the surface of water. Water has a high capacity for heat. What this means is that the many hydrogen bonds that link water molecules let water absorb a large amount of heat without changing its chemical state, for example, from liquid to gas. This not only stabilizes the temperature of bodies of water, such as lakes and oceans, but also plays an important role in the physiology of an organism. Since life is based on water, and the temperature of water rises and falls slowly, Living organisms are better able to maintain their normal internal temperatures and are protected from rapid temperature changes. And finally, the density of water is based on its temperature. Unlike many other compounds which contract when they freeze, the configuration of the hydrogen bonds in water causes it to expand when it freezes. This expansion causes ice to have a lower density than liquid water, and therefore ice floats on liquid water. If ice were more dense than water, it would sink, and ponds and lakes would freeze solid, making life there impossible. Instead, bodies of water always freeze from the top down. The ice on the surface acts as an insulator to protect the water below from freezing. This protects organisms so they can survive the winter.